but once we start chapter nine, that's going to be stuff that'll be on exam five. Okay. Covered there. So this is really like an application of transport. So we talked about stuff like in this last one, we talked about simple diffusion, facilitated transport, ways of molecules moving from high concentration to low concentration. And then I told you about active transport. Active transport's like the opposite. Active transport molecules move from low concentration to high. That never happens on its own, but the cell might have to do that in order to do a special job. Like this is the, how a nerve cell can conduct an electric, a ner, a, like a, a neural stimuli. This is how muscles can contract is by doing active transport. And anytime a cell does active transport, they are going to have to use ATP. But dialysis is really like an osmosis and diffusion. This is really a passive transport process that can be used as a way of trying to pull molecules out of the blood that don't belong there. So first off, you really need to have just a little bit of, maybe, there. First off, you need to have a little bit of background material. So your kidneys, so the job of the kidneys, the kidneys are your filters. And their job is to remove excess water salts and to remove all waste. From the blood. You have two kidneys. They're anchored or located in the back wall of like your abdominal pelvic cavity. They're about this big. So they're about four inches in size or about two and a half inches wide an inch and a half thick and they were named like if you've ever seen a kidney bean that's very much what a kidney looks like so i'm not sure if they named the bean after the kidney or the kidney after the bean i don't really know it's a chicken and an egg kind of thing but very much that is exactly the way that that curved shape is inside of the kidney are microscopic molecular filters okay so the kidney is the big structure but actually inside the filters are called the nephron This is why if you go see a nephrologist, this is a doctor that studies nephrons, that studies kidney function, kidney filtration by actually identifying these individual, think of these as microscopic filters. One kidney has a million nephrons. So the filter is called the nephron and there is about a million nephrons in one kidney. So that means if you were born with normal functioning sized kidneys, that means that you really got 2 million nephrons total at the start of life. And in fact, you can function on about a half a million. So you have like four times more than you need. So you need 500,000. in order for normal kidney filtration to occur. When people drop below 100,000, then they start talking about the patient is in kidney failure. These small molecules, all the waste molecules, excess water, excess salts, they are all going to move from high concentration to low concentration. So the blood comes into the nephron, these small molecules get pushed out of the blood and you reabsorb what you need. So you reabsorb a balanced amount of water, a balanced amount of salt, a balanced amount, well, really all your nutrients. What's in excess continues on through the filter and becomes urine, okay? So excess water, excess salt, that's, urine is almost all water with these dissolved solutes. So in the urine, urine is water, the excess water that you didn't need that gets filtered out 
and then any excess salts that you might have eaten that have been circulating in the blood, but that it's a higher concentration than the blood needs, the excess can get filtered out. And optimally, all waste molecules. So the waste molecules that are found in the blood, one of them is urea, the most common one. So there's urea and uric acid. Remember, we talked about uric acid with gout. These are two common waste molecules. They are produced by cells. So the cells make them as a byproduct of their metabolism. These waste molecules, if they build up, they're toxic. So the kidney's job is just to continually filter them out. So the goal is to have no waste molecules in the blood. But as soon as the blood passes through tissues, waste molecules diffuse into the blood. But then once it gets to the kidneys, we're going to filter it out. So a person who has kidney function less than 100,000, where they say they're in kidney failure. So a person whose kidneys are failing, they can undergo artificial dialysis. So there's hemodialysis, there's peritoneal dialysis. We're really going to talk about hemodialysis. The word hemo makes you think of what? What? Like hemoglobin, so you think of blood. So this is blood dialysis. In this process, a patient goes into a dialysis center, unless they have a dialysis machine at home, which is not very normal, okay? So a patient goes to a dialysis center. They have two ports. So they are going to have an output, so blood is removed from the body. It passes through a dialysis machine. The dialysis machine filters out or allows diffusion, so salts and water and wastes diffuse out. Once it is balanced, then that blood is returned to the patient. So they actually have an in and an out, okay? So they have two needles connected to them, two ports that they have to have connected to. And the thing to remember is that these molecules are all going from a high concentration to low concentration. Water is moving by osmosis from high concentration to low concentration. The salts are moving by diffusion from high concentration to low concentration. All small molecules can pass because in this dialysis machine, so this is really like the dialysis machine is here, in the dialysis machine there is dialysis tubing. So if you remember, we use this in lab, but if you haven't been in lab, dialysis tubing is tubing that has microscopic holes in it very, very small holes, but big enough to allow small molecules to pass. So if you have a lot of these molecules inside the blood and they can pass out, they're going to go from high concentration to low. So you will find that these very small solute particles will pass through the holes in the dialysis tubing until they make an equal concentration. So in the dialysis fluid, look at the kind of stuff that's in the dialysis fluid. It's not just water. In the dialysis fluid, this is really an isotonic solution. So what does isotonic mean? equal solutes, okay? So it's really what should be in the blood if the blood is filtered. So the sodium level, about 140.0, it's actually milliequivalents per deciliter. So sodium, that's what sodium should be in the blood. Same thing with potassium. That should be the level of potassium in the blood, calcium, bicarb, magnesium, chloride, and even glucose. So 5.5 is the correct concentration of nutrients in the blood. So think of this. This is what you want your blood to be. So the blood coming through the tubing, if there's anything high in concentration, diffusion says which way will it move? That'll move out. So for example, sodium. In the blood, in this patient, their sodium level is 160 
but in the dialysis fluid, the sodium level is 140. So that means that sodium is going to move out of the blood and into the tubing, trying to go from high concentration to low concentration. That's going to help lower the sodium levels in the blood for the patient. Potassium, same thing. If potassium is high in the patient's blood but low in the dialysis fluid, then you are going to expect potassium to move from high concentration to low concentration. What about calcium in this example? It's going to move from high concentration to low concentration. So where is it at high concentration? Do you see it's in the dialysis fluid? It's at 1.25. It's only 1.2 in the patient. So that is going to move it the opposite direction. So these ions are going to move independent of each other. Salts are going to go from wherever they're at high concentration to wherever they're at low. So what's the bicarb going to go? Mm -hmm. So it's going to go to the left. So bicarb is going to come out of the dialysis fluid and go into the blood because it's higher in the dialysis fluid, lower in the blood. Magnesium? Mm -hmm. That magnesium is going to go from 1.5 to the 0 0.5. Chloride? Mm -hmm. Right to left. And glucose? Mm -hmm. So if a patient comes in and their blood glucose is lower than it should be, this will actually increase their blood sugar. So it'll increase the blood sugar, that 5.5, about 5%, that is considered like a normal concentration. That's about a, a blood sugar of about 80. So that'll help bring their blood sugar up. So also what you're always going to have in the blood is you're going to have urea, you're going to have uric acid. Those are always going to be higher in the blood and there is none of that in the dialysis fluid. So... Take Which way is it going to move? Left or right. mm -hmm. So that is going to move urea and that is going to move uric acid out of the blood and into the dialysis fluid. So what if a patient has like really high levels of urea? Like doesn't it just go till it's equal? Remember we said things move from high concentration to low concentration until they're equal. So what if the person has like 100 millimoles of urea and none in the dialysis fluid? Well, then if it goes, they would be like 50 and 50, but that's still too high. So to make sure that you do get the correct balance, that dialysis solution is constantly replaced. So fresh dialysis fluid is constantly being added and constantly being drained off. So you don't get to equilibrium. So if the person's urea begins to diffuse out of their blood, it also gets like flushed away with the dialysis fluid and fresh dialysis fluid has zero. So that's gonna cause more urea to diffuse and that gets flushed away and so more urea diffuses. And so over time, what ends up happening to their urea concentration? It gets really low. It gets lower and lower and lower and lower. It doesn't get like 50-50 because you're constantly taking that fluid out and putting in fresh and fresh is always at zero. So how long does this take? Hours. Mm -hmm. Yep, this is a three to four hour process. three to four hours, but when the patient is done, their blood should equal the concentration of the dialysis fluid because we're not just bringing it to equilibrium. We're constantly removing the excess. So you're bringing it, bringing it, bringing it so that eventually the sodium will be 140. Calcium will be 1.25. Glucose will be 5.5. So we're not just doing it to equilibrium. We're actually, because we're replacing that dialysis fluid, we're actually getting the solutions to equal each other in concentration. This takes three to four hours, three times a week. So your two million nephrons 
they actually do this about 35 times a day. Your entire blood supply is filtered through your kidneys about 35 times a day. And so does your blood ever get imbalanced? Does your sodium levels go way high? No, because if your blood's getting, getting filtered 35 times a day, it's about every 40 minutes, then that means that excess gets filtered out, gets filtered out, gets filtered out. As it comes in, it gets filtered out quickly. I always wonder why when they, well, you know, when they have that little port thing inserted, why it look like it'd be keloid? Like not scars? Because, because these are people, like some of these people have been on this for 20, 25 years. This is not like a, a one-time thing. And so if that vein like collapses, they got to go start another one. And so you end up with like all of these knots because yeah. those, that's all scar tissue because these are pretty big gauge needles. These aren't little teeny tiny pinprick needles. They are trying to do filtration. What normally you do 35 times a day, they're trying to do in three to four hours. So, you know, that would be like 70 times in two days. Every two days you go and you're trying to do 70 times filtering in three to four hours. <laughs> so that is the person goes into the dialysis center usually doesn't feel good because their salt levels are out of whack their waist levels are high. And then after they do dialysis, everything is balanced, which well, also so makes you so tired that then you gotta go home and take a nap. So basically the day of dialysis, you don't do anything else. You get up in the morning, you go to the dialysis center, you spend the, you spend the three to four hours and then you go home and you sleep. And then the next day, things are not out of whack completely. They're somewhat balanced. That's the day that you do the doctor's appointments, you do the grocery shopping, you try to do like normal people thing. But by the end of that second day, you're already starting to have that imbalance. Your waste molecules are already starting to build up. Even if you're really careful with your diet and you don't overeat sodium and you don't, you try to make sure that you're like balanced in what your intake is, those waste molecules still build up because those are made by your cells. So there's nothing really dietary that you can do to decrease the amount of urea or uric acid that your body makes. It's just a normal waste product. So when you miss, so, okay, so like, when they say, I ain't going to dialysis today, so you double the, the nephron. Hmm? So if you say I'm not going to dialysis today, then all of this is just going to get even worse. I know. So I then you say, start feeling worse. I remember in biology, mm -hmm. Mr. Um, I always said something about these numbers. So if you don't go that day, they doubles, right? So you have a million filters yeah. in each kidney. Mm -hmm. You only need a half a million, okay? So you have you have 2 million nephrons. You need 500,000, a half a million. You have basically four times more nephrons than what you need. But if you have chronic urinary tract infections, kidney infections, hypertension, diabetes, right? All of those can cause damage to these nephrons. And when these nephrons are damaged, they do not grow back. And so what he's saying is if you don't go, then these waste molecules are building up even more and the kidneys, the nephrons you have remaining, they end up suffering because they're trying to filter, but the waste molecules are way too high. And so you end up damaging them. But really the damage is caused because of either like, <laughs> either you were, your, your kidneys were not right to begin with, like you were born with jacked up kidneys, or you had a lot of kidney infections as a kid because kidney infections can end up leading to scar tissue in the nephrons or hypertension, too much pressure, because these are all blood filters, too much pressure in the blood and the filters can blow. And then remember hyperglycemia. So we talked about hyperglycemia with diabetes. So if the blood gets too thick, it can't pass through the nephrons. If it can't pass through the nephrons, the nephron shuts off and it doesn't come back. So they just begin to shut down over time. So that's really why that timing is really important. They like to look at what your electrolyte panels are when you come in and your electrolyte panels are when you go out so that they know that they actually were successful in pulling off the excess and replenishing anything that's less than what it should be. So like, for example, with this one, if you look at the bicarb in the blood for this patient, do you see that the person's bicarb is only 20? But in the dialysis fluid, it should be 34. So diffusion 
brings bicarb into the blood to balance it. So it doesn't always just pull stuff out of the blood. Sometimes it can help and replace stuff that might be in a deficiency. So they move in both directions. The key thing to remember is it always goes from wherever it's high concentration to low concentration, no matter which side that is. As long as these, these solutes can pass through the tubing, right? As long as they're small enough to pass through the holes in the tubing, then they're going to move from high concentration to low concentration until the concentrations are equal. Okay, so that's really the application of osmosis and diffusion, this movement through semi-permeable um, membranes. So that finishes eight and lets us go on, maybe. <laughs> To nine. So nine is looking at acids and bases. So the first part is just sort of like basic information. Well, what are acids and bases? What are characteristics of acids and bases? So in this first one, so there were two, two different like chemists that studied this. There was Arrhenius who was way early. So he was like back in the 1800s. So he said, Acids have some characteristics. They taste sour. They're good at dissolving grease. If you add an acid to a metal, it will create hydrogen gas. But the big one he said is if you take an acid and you add it to water, if we take an acid like hydrochloric acid and we combine it with water, you will get hydrogen ions and they will both be aqueous okay so that H plus that H plus I could also say that H plus or HCl as a liquid plus water as a liquid when these combine I get this so all this is, is a hydrogen ion in water. Do you see that? So instead of just saying H plus aqueous, you could also say H3O plus, which is just an extra hydrogen on water because that's what that hydrogen wants to do. So they call this, this is the hydronium ion. It's a polyatomic ion. The chloride doesn't change. It's still Cl with a minus and it's Aq. So either one of these, if you see H plus or if you see H3O plus, just know they're saying the exact same thing, okay? And remember that that means it's an acid, okay? So H3O plus or H plus both indicate an acid. Bronson and Lowry, these, these guys that came in later, they turned around and said, well, acids, not only do they produce these hydrogen ions, they want to donate a hydrogen to some other molecule. So they call them proton donors. So they always lose a proton or lose a hydrogen in a reaction. And so if you look at the top above, you can actually see that. HCl plus water makes H3O plus and Cl minus. So that HCl splits up. The HCl just becomes a Cl minus. So those, that acts as a, if you look at this one to here. So you see that the HCl becomes a Cl minus, so it loses a hydrogen. So kind of like in that oxidation reduction, but that's how an, what an acid is gonna do. Acids like to get rid of hydrogens, okay? So they're gonna give up hydrogens in a reaction. So there, here's that example of like, if you see water and a hydrogen ion, they'll form this hydronium ion, H3O plus. Just know that that's saying the same thing, this and this in water, whether it's a hydrogen ion or an H3O plus, it's really just saying it's an acid. 
Okay, so same guys looked at bases and said, okay, well, characteristics of bases, bases taste bitter, bases will feel slippery on the skin. But if you put bases in water, a base that is put in water will break up and form hydroxide ions. So this, NaOH, in water, when it's dissolved, it's a strong electrolyte and always forms this OH minus. The OH minus, remember that's a polyatomic ion that we actually talked about, that's the hydroxide ion. So that is the characteristic ion. Oh wait, aqueous, AQ. NaOH as a solid, this is being S, it's a solid. Water would just be a liquid. So remember when the, whatever you see in parentheses, it's solid, liquid, gas, or aqueous. It's just telling you the state that it's in. So the Bronsted and Lowry guys said, okay, yeah, that does produce hydroxide ions. But another characteristic of bases is that bases like to accept protons. So they like to gain hydrogen ions. So it's not always evident in a reaction where you see hydrogen ions. You really have to have an acid there with the base to see the hydrogen being transferred from one to the other. But the one to remember is that the acid's always gonna give up its hydrogen. The base is always going to take that on. So here's an example in this first one. Can you see hydro hydrogen chloride, which is hydrochloric acid? So in this reaction, what it ends up doing is it gets rid of its hydrogen and becomes just a Cl minus. Water in this reaction takes on the hydrogen ion. So they say in this that HCl is the acid and that water is acting as a base. Down at the one that's at the bottom, if you have ammonia, NH3, and you bubble it through water, the ammonia will take on a hydrogen and become NH4 plus, and the water will become an OH minus. So in this, the ammonia takes on a hydrogen, right? It's a hydrogen acceptor, or it increases in its hydrogen number. That's a base. And the water in this example actually loses the hydrogen. So in this one, water acts as an acid. So water can be either an acid or a base, depending on its condition. <clears throat> Depends on what it's with. So some acids that we've talked about in class, so we have talked about or we've used in lab. Hmm? So we've used like sulfuric acid, we've used hydrochloric acid, we even used nitric acid. That was way back in the very first lab. Hydrochloric acid, like I saw it today in the um, in Lowe's, it's called muriatic acid. So that is an acid you can like go buy an entire container of it. It's about a 20% hydrochloric acid solution. <laughs> and people use it to clean like their concrete, their driveways, because if there's any grease on your driveway, you throw down some acid and scrub it and it'll dissolve that grease. So it breaks it up and then you can rinse it. Just use lots of water, <laughs> lots of water because it's a 20% solution of acid. So you definitely want to rinse it. So these ones are ones that you've seen. Sulfuric acid was a common catalyst that we used in reactions like when we made aspirin, when we made oil of wintergreen. So there was one other thing that we had to add sulfuric. We did that in the beginning. Remember that it, it ate through the cotton cloth right, on the very first lab, so there's a hole in it. So that was sulfuric acid, hydrochloric acid, nitric acid. But notice these ones, they, they put that H out front. In most of the acids, they put the H out front. That's a good indication that you're talking about an acid. Bases, on the other hand, when we made soap, we used sodium hydroxide. So I called that lye, when we made lye soap. 
potassium hydroxide, calcium hydroxide we used last week when we were doing the um, neutralization reaction. The thing to remember that strong acids and bases, they are going to make a lot of hydrogen ions or a lot of hydroxide ions. So remember a strong electrolyte. If you have a strong acids and base, then that means that it forms 100% of ions. So if you take hydrochloric acid, HCl, and you bubble it through water, 100% form ions. That's by definition a strong electrolyte. Remember with the light bulb experiment, really bright light bulb because it makes lots of ions, but those hydrogen ions and those hydroxide ions in high concentration, they are reactive, which is why they call them corrosive. They will react with body tissues and cause damage. So if you see something that is labeled corrosive, then you know you don't want it to come in direct contact with your skin for prolonged periods of time. Best if you wear gloves. Try to protect the skin because they're very reactive ions in strong acids and bases. Hmm? Question? Mm -hmm, the hydroxide, the OH, right? So if you see if you see a formula with an OH at the end, then that's going to be a base. If you see a hydrogen out in front, odds are that it's an acid. Not all the time, but it's a pretty good chance. Okay, but then what about this? And I actually changed this form. So if you have printed your slides, this um, this formula, I changed the arrow. So the arrow is not one direction. Notice that the arrow goes both directions. So this is acetic acid, which is vinegar. This is one that we used last time when we did the electrolyte test. This is the one that was really dim light bulb. So about 95% of the acetic acid molecules, they don't form ions. Only about 5% does. So this is the one that if you have acetic acid dissolved in water, so if you put vinegar in water, most of the vinegar molecules stay as a molecule. They do not form ions. So most of them stay, no ions that are present. Only five out of a hundred molecules form an ion. So in solution, I'm going to have water molecules in this beaker. I'm going to have CH3COOH, which is the acetic acid molecules. But then I'll also have a few ions produced, but not very many. So that means all of them are present. It doesn't just form product. I end up with this balance. And so you remember that arrow, the double arrow shows that it's reversible. So that means like some of them will form ions and some of them will reform back into non-ion form. That's a weak electrolyte, a weak acid or base, Are, these are weak electrolytes, and so they're going to make just a few. So if you get vinegar on you, is it going to cause skin irritation? Is it going to like cause redness and skin breakdown like hydrochloric acid could? No, because it doesn't make a lot of electrolytes. 
If it doesn't make a lot of ions, then it's not going to be as reactive. So weak acids and bases are typically not as corrosive as strong because they don't make as many ions. Mm -hmm. So if you have a sample of an acid or a base, you can decrease the amount of ions by doing what is called neutralization. So a neutralization is going to help to take this acid and base and form something that is not as reactive. Hmm? So neutralization, this is what happens when you take a strong acid and a strong, really any acid and base and combine them. The hydrogen ions are reactive, the hydroxide ions are reactive. So if I take HCl, that is a strong acid, plus NaOH, that is a strong base. Both of these are corrosive. If I combine them, they do a double displacement. So the sodium of the base will combine with which part of the acid? Uh huh. So a weak acid or base only makes a few ions. The rest stay together. So in this one, like 95% don't form ions. Only about 5% does. And that's the reason why the electricity with the light bulb, it was really dim. Mm -hmm. Because the only way I can carry an electric current is having ions. And if only five out of 100 have ions, then it didn't carry very much electricity. And so it was a really dim light bulb, okay? And it really has to do with, so acetic acid is more stable as a molecule, less stable as an ion. So that's why it tends to stay together. It tends not to spl split up into ions. It only does it just every once in a while because it's only like five out of 100. So it's more stable in which the higher percent form. Okay, so if you look at this one, HCl plus NaOH, the sodium combines with which part of the strong acid? The Na will end up combining with the Cl and make NaCl, sodium chloride. And then the H and the OH combine, so H and OH make H2O. So do you see if I take these two things that are corrosive, these two things that react with body tissues, and I mix them in equal amounts, I can neutralize their reactivity. I can take them and make salt water, right? So salt water, you can splash that on yourself all the time. Not a problem, right? Just be like sticky salty at the end, but it is not going to cause damage. So it's an acid and a base, when they combine, that is why they say they're neutralized because we have decreased the amount of acid of the ions present, so it's not going to be as irritating. So a acid plus the base forms a salt and water. That is a neutralization reaction. So we go from where there's lots of ions to neutral ions. Sodium ions, chloride ions, but not hydrogen ions, not hydroxide ions. So you actually do something similar with antacids. So if you go out and you have, for me it's Mexican food. <laughs> I still eat Mexican food. <laughs> okay, but it's the salsa. So it's the acids of the tomato. It's the sauces and such. So in this... In an antacid, if you have excess stomach acid because of what you were eating, <laughs> some people just have more acid produced than what they need. If you have too much stomach acid, then what that can cause is it can actually cause it to push up into the esophagus. The esophagus is not designed for stomach acid, so it can cause irritation. So they used to always call it like gas, um, acid reflux or GERD 
or um, esophageal reflux disease. So those are all different ways of saying is basically you have this acid indigestion. So you get this like burning sensation, okay? So to get rid of this, I wanna reduce the amount of acid in my stomach. So I take a mild or weak base. I don't wanna use something like lye, Drano. I don't want to use anything that's got a lot of ions formed. Instead, I'm going to use a weak base because the weak base is not going to make a lot of hydroxide ions, but it'll still react with an acid. So taking a Tums, a Rolaids, baking soda, all examples of antacids, they will react with the excess stomach acid and convert that to salt and water. And so you'll notice that stomach irritation goes away. So it decreases it. Now, if you use anything that is called a carbonate, so this is like Tums is calcium carbonate, baking soda is um, sodium bicarbonate, anything with that CO3, when the acid reacts with it, it always makes this. And how do you know? What does that make you do? Carbon dioxide builds up in your stomach and it makes you gas burp. It doesn't oh, make you gap. It. Yeah, usually if you take a Tums or you take baking soda, you go <laughs> afterwards. That is all because of carbon like dioxide. Huh? Like a Pepsi. Yeah, well, that's the yeah, carbonic acid becomes CO2 as well. But that carbon dioxide actually forms in the stomach. And so it is not uncommon after having some Tums, any kind of carbonate. So remember we did, um, we had calcium carbonate and we had the calcium carbonate and then sodium carbonate. Those were the two carbonates that we used. And you saw bubbling in the beakers, right? Remember you added them in and you were sitting there. Some of them just barely fizzed. Some made pretty good sized bubbles. All those bubbles were carbon dioxide. If you remember way back to lab one, in lab one, if you weren't there, we used a lot of strong acids. And so I had you bring like your, your cotton cloths and your little pieces of egg, everything in the sugar in the cup, everything went into that beaker at the front of the room. And I was putting baking soda in. So it had water and baking soda. Baking soda is a base. So you were adding these acids in. And as they were adding, it was like foaming and bubbling. And people were like, wow, that's kind of neat. All I was doing was a neutralization reaction. I was reacting that strong acid until the bubbling stopped. And then I knew I could throw that in the trash because now it's neutral. Now it's not going to react with the trash, <laughs> with any of the paper towels in the trash. It's not going to harm the cleaning people that come and empty the trash. So doing this neutralization reduces the amount of reactive ions. And that's really the goal. Is we want to reduce the reactive ions in the solution. It's okay. Reduce. It's okay. You, I want to reduce. That's not what I meant to say. Okay. So I want to, yeah, I have an A you in here to too. <laughs> Re, let me write smaller. Reduce the reactive ions that are in the solution. So I want to get rid of the H pluses. I want to get rid of the OH minuses because those are the things that are reactive and going to cause irritation, damage to body tissues. Sodium chloride, calcium chloride, magnesium chloride, those are fine. Those are just ions. Those are not going to cause any type of damage. They're not going to be reactive like your acids and bases are. So in these reactions, when we have reversible reactions, we can reach what they call equilibrium. So equilibrium, this can occur if we mix acids and bases, especially weak acids and bases. They're not going to react as strongly with each other. Instead, you end up with this sort of like reaction or reactants and products all present in the solution. So in this, one example, they use this as their general example, is if you take nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas and combine them, you can form an H3, 
Okay, so that's the forward reaction, is if I have a beaker or a container, because they're gases, so these are all gases. So if I take N2 and I add H2, N2 and H2, N2 and H2, so I fill this, some of these molecules will react and I will end up with NH3. So some more will react, I'll get NH3, some more will react, I'll get NH3, but at some point, the NH3 can break down into nitrogen and hydrogen. So I can have the reverse reaction occur. So the forward, and then I can have the reverse, and eventually it reaches equilibrium. So equilibrium is when the forward and the reverse reactions are the same, and there's no change in the amount of reactant or product. So it doesn't mean that I end up with a lot of product or I end up with a lot of reactant. I'm going to end up with some amount of each. And the key thing is, is that they become equal. Yeah. Okay. The amount of that's present is equal. It may not be that I have equal amounts of nitrogen and NH3, but the amount that I have becomes like stable. It doesn't change. So they use this equilibrium arrow, there's arrow to go back and forth, and it's an indication that the amount of reactant and product doesn't change when they reach this point. So there was a guy that studied this. So there was a guy that studied equilibrium, spent his entire career studying equilibrium, just like Boyle studied Le Chatelier, uh -huh. French, French guy. Okay, yep, Le Chatelier. Mm -hmm. So he studied this, he studied equilibrium, and he said, okay, so if you have a sample and it's at equilibrium, that means I have reactant and product and it's at equilibrium, what happens if I change some component? What if I add reactant? What if I take away product? Okay, what happens to the reaction if I change some criteria of the reaction? So what he found in this first one, he said, if I add anything to a reaction that's already at equilibrium, the reaction always moves away from what I add. So he said, if I add nitrogen, so if I have my container and I pump in some nitrogen, I will have more NH3 made the reaction will shift away from whatever I add. So if I add nitrogen into the container, this will cause the forward reaction, where you can think left to right, To increase. And it will increase and happen more until I reach a balance again. Because the goal is to restore balance. He said the exact same thing happens if I have this container and it's at equilibrium and I add product. If I add NH3, so now this side, the product side, becomes greater, then I will have the reverse reaction occur, which will shift the reaction away from whatever I add. It'll make more nitrogen and hydrogen, and it'll do that until I come back to balance. Okay, so if I add, I like thinking about this like a seesaw. <laughs> That's just me. So if I'm thinking the adding NH3, or sorry, this one, if I add N2, do you see that if I add N2, the left side gets heavier? So the only way to bring it into balance is to shift and make more product. So that will force this reaction. If I add NH3, NH3, is my product, that's gonna shift so that the right side is heavy. The only way to restore balance is to do what? Add more product. Mm -hmm. Shift the product to the reactant side. So it'll make more reactant. 
shifting the reaction to the left away from whatever I added. So he found if one side of the reaction, if you gain, the reaction always shifts away from whatever I add. He also looked at what happens if I take away a substance. So if I remove NH3 and this one, if I remove product, what's that going to do to the seesaw? Mm -hmm. If I remove NH3, then that means my NH3 side is going to be very light, right? So that side ends up being high. And the goal is to try and get it so that it's equal. The only way to restore balance is to shift the reaction which direction? Which way? Mm -hmm. It's going to shift towards whatever you removed. So this one, the forward reaction, will help to restore balance. So one last one, what if, what if I remove H2? What if I remove hydrogen? Will the reaction go to the right or the left? going to shift towards whatever I took out. So you got to look at the reaction. Which did I remove? Did I re remove reactant or product? And if I remove H2, is that reactant or product? It's reactant because it's on the left. Okay. So then that says I'm going to have to shift to the reaction towards whatever I remove. So it'll shift it to the left to restore balance. So in this one, you can think that your seesaw ends up like that. If I pull H2 out, then that side's too light. So I'm going to have to shift the reaction towards whatever I removed to try and bring it back into its balance. So he said, if one side of the reaction loses a substance, the reaction will always shift toward whatever you remove. If you add something, the reaction shifts away from whatever you removed. So that's the difference. So if I add, it shifts away from the side I add. If I remove, the reaction shifts towards whatever I removed. So the easiest way to do this is just to practice some of them. What about temperature, though? Because we have reactions that are exothermic and endothermic. So exothermic and endothermic this reaction is exothermic. So do you see that this reaction, heat, is a product? So just treat heat like a product. So if I add heat, reaction shifts away from the side with heat. If I remove heat, if I chilled my sample, reaction's going to shift towards the heat side. The heat is exothermic. Mm -hmm. Exothermic, remember exo is out of, right? So a reaction that's exothermic, rea the heat is out of. If it's an endothermic, so this would be like NH4. I'm trying to remember what the thing with the, with the ice pack one. It's ammonium. can't remember what the reaction is. Hold on. You can write this down if you find it. Of course, it does help if you have a signal.
was very close. So it's NH4, that was right. <laughs> NO3, it's a solid. So if you've ever had an ice pack, like those ones, the instant ice packs, so there is like these crystals in it, it's like solid. And then there's this little blister pack with, with water inside. And so what you do is you like smack it and it breaks the blister pack and you shake it up and it just gets cold. So the crystals that are inside are NH4, NO3, okay? So the crystals, I'll write it a little better. So it's N, it's not changed, NH4, NO3, solid, okay? So it's the same thing, it's ammonium nitrate. And if you put it, if you add water, so that's what's actually in the sample, it requires heat for this to occur, which is why it gets cold. But it forms an H4 plus aqueous and cold. Mm -hmm. Yep, it's a cold pack. Like if you've ever, if you've had like one of those instant cold packs, this is how it works. When that ammonium nitrate dissolves, it's dissolving actually create um, absorbs heat, and so the cold pack gets cold. So in this, if I have arrows go in both directions, so we're going to say it's an equilibrium reaction. So for the first one, so the first one, nitrogen plus three hydrogens forms two NH3s plus heat. So it's exothermic in the first example. So you tell me which way will the reaction shift if I add heat. So if I take the sample and I begin to heat it, which way the, re the reaction's at equilibrium, so it's balanced, and I add heat. It shifts whenever you add, the reaction shifts away from whatever you add. So which side has heat? Which side has heat? Mm -hmm. Okay, so heat is on the right, so the reaction shifts away from whatever I add. So the reaction shifts in reverse. So if it goes to the left, that's the reverse reaction. Okay, who tell me what would happen if I added H2? Which way will the reaction shift? If you added it. Mm -hmm. If it's at equilibrium, right. hmm? which way it always, if, whenever you add. To the left, we gotta go away. Right, so you gotta find H2 in the reaction. Is it on the right or the left? It's on the left, so that means it's going to shift to the right. Mm -hmm. Right? So if I add reactant, the reaction is going to shift to the right, which is like also called the forward reaction. What if I remove NH3? If you remove it. Find it, first find it in the reaction. So you, when it tells you one, whatever I remove, the reaction shifts towards whichever one I remove. Mm -hmm. So see down over here, so it's this one. So if I remove NH3, the reaction is going to shift forward to the right to replace what I removed. Okay, so you tell me what's going to happen in these. So which direction? So I have NH4, NO3 is a solid dissolving in water with, with heat forms an equilibrium of NH4 plus and NO3 minus aqueous. So what's going to happen if I add heat? Which direction will the reaction shift? It's going to go to the right. 
Heat is on the left, and it, whenever you add, it, the reaction shifts away from whatever you add. Okay? What if, so then what if I remove heat? So if I add heat, it's going to cause the reaction to shift away from the heat side. If I remove heat, it's going to cause the reaction to shift towards the heat side. So it'll go which way? To the left. Because see the heat is a reactant in this one. So notice that those ones are opposite compared to the top reaction. Just depends on where the heat is. And all I would say is just pretend heat is a reactant or heat is a product. Okay? Because if you can figure out which direction it shifts with a reactant or a product, just pretend heat is a reactant or a product. Exothermic heat is a product. Endothermic heat is always a reactant. What would happen if I added NO3 minus? So find NO3. If I add, which way is the reaction going to shift, towards or away from the NO3? So if I add NO3 minus... Will the reaction shift towards or away from the NO3? Away. away. Whatever I add, it shifts away. So find NO3. Is it which side? It's on the right side. See NO3 over on the right? I don't know what you're saying. Oh, 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 NO3. Uh-huh. NO3 minus all by itself. It's over on the right side, so I know it's going to shift to the left. Okay? What if I remove NH4 plus? So find NH4 plus. Whenever you remove, the reaction shifts to, the to whatever I removed. So which side have I removed it from? From the right. Mm -hmm. So that means it's going to go to the right. To the right. Mm -hmm. So the thing to remember, if I add, if I add reactant or product, it will always shift away. From whatever you added. When you add something, the reaction shifts away from what you add. And if I remove reactant or product, the reaction is always going to shift towards whatever you pulled out. All right, because if I add, it's going to make that side too heavy. So I'm trying to get it back into balance. So I'm shifting away from whatever I add to try and restore balance. If I pull product out, I'm going to shift towards the product side to try and balance that again. And like I said, I always think of like a seesaw when I think about equilibrium. Because equilibrium, optimally, they should be equal. But if I add to this side, then the reaction has to shift away. If I remove from this side, there's not enough, and it's the light side, then I'm going to have to shift towards it to try and bring it back to that balance between. Okay, so here's one. So NH3 plus HSO4 minus plus heat forms an equilibrium reaction with NH4 plus and SO4 two minus. In the above reaction, when it's at equilibrium, so right now we're starting at equilibrium, which way will the reaction shift if I add NH4 plus, remove SO4 two minus, add heat, remove HSO4, just answer each one of those. And you can just circle which one you think it is. And I have a demo for this, but I guess I'll bring it on Wednesday. I don't know why my brain, like, I can't, like, keep up with my demos. <laughs> I have to go find my beakers. <laughs>
So if I add NH4 plus, am I adding reactant or product? Product. Mm -hmm. So this might help. What is what is going on? Why do I have a mock? Look, now I have a. <laughs> I give up. No, it's like I have a red dot. Do you see it? So this is, all right, now it's working. <laughs> okay, so do you see NH4 plus? Do you see it's on the product side? It's on the right. Okay. Okay, so if I add NH4, which direction is the reaction going to go? Reverse. Mm -hmm. It's going to go to the left. It goes away from whatever I add. Okay, now what if I remove SO4 2 minus? So the key thing is, is find SO4 2 minus. Is it a reactant or product? It's a product. Mm -hmm. So this is a product. So if it's a product, when I remove it, which direction is the reaction going to shift? Forward. Forward. It's going to go towards whatever I took away. Now, what if I add heat? Heat is really a what? What is heat? Is heat a reactant or a product? It's a reactant. So if I add, that's going to cause the reaction to shift forward, away from what I add. Okay? So notice if I add reactant, it shifts away. If I add product, it shifts away. What about if I remove HSO4 minus? That is a what? Product. Yeah, it's a reactant. And I took some away. So which way will it shift? It ain't going forward. It says you remove it. Anytime you remove, the reaction shifts towards whatever I removed. Mm -hmm. So if I removed reactant, the reaction shifts towards what I removed. And then the last one, if I add NH3, that means I'm adding what? Reactant. So that means the reaction is going to shift away from what I add. So it will shift to the forward, mm -hmm. shift to the right. Okay, so there are, there are some um, homework questions on these ones, so try to practice those. We'll do another one, like I'll just pick another one as we go along through. All right, so we'll leave this until Wednesday. So on Wednesday, we will pick up, we will talk about acids and bases. One, the last type, which they call weak acids and bases, how they react and come into play, and then we're going to go on and talk about pH, which is right here. Okay, so we've really got like, like characteristics, what weak acids and bases do. We already know strong acids and bases neutralize, right? Strong acids and bases make salt and water, but weak acids and bases don't make a lot of ions, so they react, but they don't react like, like strong acids and bases, and then we can finish up that way. All right, so here is your. Oh, you Here's your tape, girl. Well, it's, it's, it's only 740. <laughs> Class is supposed to be over 745. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Okay, so here is your take home exam. Six pages. Six. Hey. Mm -hmm. Right, whatever I add, the reaction shifts away. Whatever I remove, the reaction shifts towards. So that doesn't matter. So if I remove the product, it goes forward. Because if I took this away, so it has to shift to replace it. Whatever I remove, the reaction shifts towards whatever I remove. So I remove this. So the reaction goes that way. So, Ms. Carmichael, what are you going to do with all these calculators with your name? Right, it's not, it depends on if you're talking about a reaction or a product. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. If I add reaction or product, add reaction or product, not and product, or only reaction. <laughs> so like, I'm like confused. So, so we're <laughs> up to like, our test on. No, this is it. This is the whole test. Oh, so you know. Just this. It's all on paper. There's not on movement. I just put it all on paper. So you write all your answers on paper. Don't leave anything blank. Even if you think maybe it's not the right answer, put the answer. <laughs> okay. okay. So it's forward. Yeah.
Does that make more sense now? Okay. Doesn't matter if it's reactants or product. Anytime I add something, reaction shifts away from it. Doesn't matter if it's reactants or product. Every time I pull something out, the reaction shifts towards whatever I pulled away. It depends if it's a product. No, it doesn't. Okay. So look. If. Okay, so here, so look at that top one. If I add HCN, the, re okay. the reaction shifts to the forward. Do you see that? It shifts away from the HCN. But if I add HNO2, the reaction shifts away from the HNO2. Whatever I add, the reaction shifts away. So it doesn't matter. If I add this, reaction goes this way. If I add this, reaction goes this way. If I add this, reaction goes this way. Whatever I add, the reaction shifts away from whatever I add. Oh, okay. So if I add this, reaction goes this way. If I add this, reaction goes this way. Right? So whatever gets added, the reaction shifts away. Whatever I remove, the reaction shifts towards. So if I take this out, reaction's going to shift towards what I took away. If I take this out, reaction shifts towards whatever I took away. If I take this out, reaction shifts towards whatever I took away. Doesn't matter if it's a reactant or a product. The reaction always shifts away from whatever you add and towards whatever you remove. So if I remove this, which way? If I take this out, reaction is going to shift to the, mm -hmm. okay? If I remove this, reaction shifts this way. It just shifts towards whatever I pulled out. Does that help? That's, so it doesn't matter if it's a reaction to a product, okay? So if I take this out, which way? Mm -hmm. Yep, if I take this away, now this side's not heavy enough, so the reaction has to shift towards it to bring it back into balance. Okay? So in, in, in an equilibrium reaction, it doesn't matter which one it is. It doesn't matter if it's exothermic or endothermic. Just treat heat as a reactant or a product. It doesn't matter if I add or remove reactants or product, but anytime I add something, the reaction shifts away from whatever I add. In a full going that way. If you add or remove, Take if I away. take NH4 away, then yes, it shifts this way. Okay? If I remove this, if I remove this, or remove this, reaction is going to shift forward. If I remove this or this, reaction is going to sh shift in reverse. Okay. It's is really... That up here? Hmm? That ain't up here. Not on this test. Okay. This is on your fifth test. <laughs> so now you just got to remember it. <laughs> I'll never remember this. <laughs>